So, who wears ties in Queensland? I know, I know. Should be against the law. I think my dog's trying to get in the door. He normally would be allowed in, wouldn't he? Yes, he would. Good evening, anyone. We're just waiting for a minute or so for everybody to come into the webinar this evening and then we'll get started. Just want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to come in at the ground floor and, and see us start off. Might be a second. All right, I think that is our cue to get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our retirement planning webinar this evening. Uh, I'm one of your hosts this evening, Bill Thompson. And I am a relationship manager out of our Brisbane office. And joining me this evening, um, can I introduce you to Sonia White, who's a member of our financial planning team. Say hello, hello everybody. Sonia. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a while since I've done one of these. I think. Uh, it's good to see that we've got people from all over the country joining us this evening. Uh, I think we've even got some people over from Western Australia. I'm glad to see that the Premier has let you out to, uh, to come and join the rest of the country for the first time in a little while. And uh, it's been quite hot over there. So hopefully uh, it's cooled down and everybody's a little bit more comfortable. Um, just a, a, a few bits and pieces that we'd like to do before we get started. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live. I'd like to recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, perhaps one of the most important slides we will do this evening, I do need to let you know that everything that we discussed with you here this evening in today's presentation uh, is of a general advice nature only because we're not taking into consideration your personal financial circumstances, uh, your goals or, or any of those details. Please take that into consideration when you make any decisions based on that information. If it's appropriate, uh, you can consider the product and dis product disclosure statement and the target market determination, which is uh, both available on our website or uh, seek excuse me, financial advice uh, if, if you need that to help you make that decision. So thank you very much everyone for joining us. Let's get into the presentation this evening. Um, we are talking about retirement. So I, I, I guess the first came off the rank and, and one of the first decisions you'll need to make is what your retirement goals are. Um, now, obviously what you want to do in retirement is a very independent decision. Um, but it will have a significant impact on how much money you might need to support that lifestyle in retirement. We've got a few examples on the screen there in front of you. Um, travel isn't necessarily something that's been uh, available to us over the last couple of years. Uh, as our WA friends would be aware, that has even included internally. But with things uh, settling, I guess, suppose somewhat in terms of COVID, travel has become available. So where you want to go will dictate how much that costs, how long you want to go for, those sorts of things. Um, some of you, when you do retire, might want to spend a lot more time with family. Uh, an example that I tend to use is, uh, is my mother. My mother is a small country girl, grew up within a very small radius, um, moved just down the road and she's been happy in our little hometown down in Finlay uh, ever since. Her idea of a comfortable retirement is to spend some time in the garden, taking care of the grandchildren from time to time um, and doing short trips uh, in and around the local area, doing some camping and those sorts of things. As you can imagine, that's not something that costs a, a great deal of money. Um, whereas if you want to do nice cruises or travel overseas, uh, they're definitely things that are going to cost a little bit more. Not sure how many people are interested in doing cruises at the moment, Sonia, but... Um, not on the Ruby Princess anyway. <laughs> not anytime soon, I wouldn't have thought. 
Um, but, you know, retirement goals, what, what sort of things will you discuss with them as a planner? I think uh, anything I do is very much goal driven. And you're right, they're going, going to have different costs associated with them. And we're in the business of helping people meet their goals in the best possible way. Uh, because if you have a, a retirement pot that you're starting with, uh, how do you make that last? You know, you, you have a number of years. And, and so how many of your goals are possible? Uh, are they all possible? Um, people get the comfort from knowing that's a yes. Or if uh, it looks like things need tweaking, you're better off to know sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I think life expectancy has a little bit to do with that as well. I'm, I'm not expecting to live to 100, um, but I think that definitely factors in as well. I'm not suggesting I won't, but I'm, <laughs> I'm leaning on the side of probably not. <laughs> Only the good die young, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> but some people say they're busier in retirement than they ever were and they're working lives yep. uh, so um, you know that that's important for us to know well, my goal is not to be as busy as i am <laughs> now in retirement sonia um i should also say as well as we progress through this there's uh there is a lot of people attending but we would like to make sure that you get the information that you want out of tonight's session so if you've got a question please make sure that you post it through the the questions and answers um tab on the on the top well, mine's on the left-hand side, the Q&A uh, speech bubble. If we get the opportunity and it's appropriate, we'll answer those throughout the presentation or at the end. If we get too many questions and we can't answer those, I'll just let you know that uh, one of our regional managers will be in touch throughout the week and we'll make sure that you get an answer to that question. So um, please send those through as we go ahead. I guess whether or not you have enough money to live on in, when you are in retirement, again, depends on what you want to do uh, and how much you have at your disposal. But to give you a bit of an example of what that might look like from an income perspective uh, over a year, we've got uh, the full age pension here on this particular slide where you've got the singles and the couples um, at, at 25, 6,000. 25,677 apologies and th just over 38,000 for a couple. To give you a bit of context about uh, what that kind of means, uh, the Association of Superannuation Funds Australia have done uh, a lot of research around what a comfortable or modest lifestyle looks like in retirement. And we've included those figures for you as well, just to give you a bit of an idea as to what sort of a, an income you might need as a, as a single or a couple in retirement to support those types of lifestyle. Um, Sonia, I know from a financial planning perspective, we don't necessarily think in income on a year by year basis in retirement. We go, okay, what does that look like from a balanced perspective? Can you shed any light on what that looks like in these examples? Yes, certainly. Uh, so if you would like a comfortable lifestyle and uh, assuming you retire at 65 and assuming a rate of return of 5%, then a single person uh, could retire on 545,000 and have a comfortable lifestyle and a couple 640,000. Uh, so there is a, a bit of a fallacy, I guess, that you need $1 million to retire comfortably. Uh, that's not the case, but provided you uh, choose your investments wisely and, and get the strategy right. It's also assuming you've paid off your mortgage. Uh, so uh, there's no mortgage repayments and there's no rent included in these expenses. So it may be the case that uh, you need a little bit more money uh, if you're in those situations. My, my retirement plan does include winning lotto. Sonia, so the million dollars <laughs> should be a viable option. Excellent, Bill. <laughs> Looking forward now, to hearing about that. <laughs> you might not. I might just disappear <laughs> off into the sunset. Um, now, I mentioned ASPA, the Association of Superannuation Funds Australia, and the research that they've done into different types of lifestyles in retirement. There's a really good document that's available on their website. Uh, and if you look down the very bottom of that, if you look up in Google, the Association of Superannuation Funds Australia Retirement Standard, um, you'll be able to see a copy of this document. And I believe some of those details are actually in a handout that's available after this particular webinar. Um, but if you have a look on the screen there, 
you've got a comfortable lifestyle in retirement on the left-hand side. And what I like about this document is it actually gives you some practical examples about what you might expect in retirement under those different lifestyles. And I'll focus on the comfortable one because I'm imagining that's where we would all like to be, obviously. Um, and I'm gonna go straight down to the bottom one, which is private health insurance. So I guess a comfortable lifestyle allows you to have a decent level of private health cover. And as we get older, we know that our health slowly deteriorates and, uh, and things can become a little bit more expensive in, in that particular um, realm. But, you know, other things on there, Sonia, like things like your, your holidays, what types of holidays and how often you can go on a holiday. Those are also factors um, in, in this particular document. Absolutely. Eating out, uh, repairs on your car and home. Uh, I do meet people from time to time that can manage to save a bit of money uh, if they're on the age pension, but it really depends where they're living and um, you know, how practical they are. Um, but uh, just having a little bit more actually for the modest lifestyle can make a big difference and you don't actually need that much in super to have a modest lifestyle. Uh, the, as for um, amounts of 70,000 for a single person and a couple. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's very easy to achieve something a little bit more than the age pension. Yeah, um, just a question in there at the moment uh, around the 545,000, whether or not that is a balance at retirement to support a couple or a, a single. And it's That's a single, a single isn't it, Sonia? and yes, and six hundred and forty thousand for a couple. Yeah, shared expenses essentially is 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 the key reason for that being uh, not a big discrepancy between a couple and a single. So, obviously, anything above that is a bit of a bonus. Um, yes, in that sense. But we actually do modelling. We can fine tune uh, projections to look at your uh, tolerance for risk and uh, customise. Uh, the sort of goals that you have and show you how long your money will last. Wonderful. And uh, budgets, budgets, Sonia. I know that's a favourite topic oh, for everybody. The word. Oh, <laughs> Sorry to bring it up. No, no, it's important because uh, it does scare a lot of people away from the advice process. And I just want to assure people that you don't actually have to have a budget. It, it's a very useful tool. I've gone through the process myself. Um, I know it can be painful, but if you don't have one, there's other ways to skin a cat. So we don't actually um, drill down into the budget unless something looks a bit askew. We can actually um, then say, okay, what do you need to live on? Uh, and work backwards if that's your preference or we could look at uh, what you're earning and does that accumulate or does does your cash balance go down um, so it's it's quite uh, possible not to have to go through the pain of a budget um, we can start with uh, what people need as a modest lifestyle or a comfortable lifestyle and work from that um, of course there's risks of, of just using assumptions and not using your actual expenditure I've got a brilliant budget, Sonia. My issue occurs when I actually have to show the discipline to <laughs> um, to to work through that. But thankfully, I've I've got someone that's taking control of that for me. She Team loves work. me. She yeah. loves me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I guess the other thing that I that I run into from time to time, Sonia, and this is something that I know you can help people with. Superannuation is obviously going to form up the largest part of, of most people's retirement planning. Um, but I think we tend to forget that there are other elements that we can add into that jigsaw puzzle that can create the broader picture. And that's something that I know you and, and your colleagues within the team uh, can also help people with. For sure. Not everybody uh, has had the opportunity to get money into super or even want to. Um, because of the preservation rules. They may have accumulated assets outside. Uh, all of these uh, assets can be a source of funds for retirement. We'll come back to the family house and how to release equity from that. But, but the main thing is that uh, if you tinker with one of these, uh, you may impact the other, or there may be a, a preferred way to utilize these in retirement to minimize tax and uh, make sure um, you get the best outcome for uh, state planning purposes. So I think uh, the holistic view makes sense um, to, to optimise your situation. 
Do you want to touch base on the family house or would you like to address that later, Sonia? We're going to come back to that. Um... Okay, excellent. I know we touch base on it a little bit later on. Now, this is probably quite topical, uh, the, the benefits of savings within superannuation. We've obviously got the uh, the big budget announcement tomorrow night, and that'll be very interesting to see what uh, comes out of that. There's a lot of uh, whispers and rumours and, and news articles going around, uh, I guess, predicting what's going to come out in the budget. Um, but cost of living pressures are, are probably top of the list. But in terms of superannuation, I guess one of the most significant benefits is rather than pay your marginal tax rate within superannuation, everything that you put into superannuation concessionally is taxed at only 15%. Um, so there's real advantages there. Um, if you are in a position where you can set up a transition to retirement, it's not as effective as it was when it was first introduced because now any investment earnings within your uh, transition to retirement pension are taxed at 15%, whereas previously they weren't. Um, but of course, once you're at a position uh, over 65 or over your preservation age and fully retired from the workforce, uh, anything within an, an account-based pension is tax-free. Lovely. It doesn't get better than that. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Although they could bring that uh, preservation age forward would be very, very nice. And that's a question that we've actually had um, sent through um, just recently, and I'll answer that for, uh, for our member. So your preservation age is a little bit dependent upon when you were born. So we're going to address that and I'll show you a slide in a little bit um, that'll dictate where and when you can access um, your retirement. But there are different ways that you can do that as well. Um, it wasn't necessarily a sure thing, but uh, last year, I think it was, the, the government announced that they were going to maintain the superannuation guarantee rate increase that had been delayed. Um, so we saw the first increase on 1 July last year, and we've got another one due on 1 July 2022, where the superannuation guarantee is going to go from 10% to 10.5%, and year on year, it will continue until it gets out to 12%. So you can see it's certainly people starting in the workplace in the here and now for the first time are going to be seriously advantaged in terms of their retirement planning. Um, but it's also going to assist those of us that are that have been in the system for a while and maybe looking at retiring in the near or just in the midterm future, um, just to put that little bit extra in there and, and take advantage of that. Um, but it's good legislation, I think, Sonia. For sure, yeah, it's enforced savings. Um, building up your retirement balance is a good thing. Uh, we need to be careful though, there's uh, a concessional cap. So if the super guarantee goes up and your salary sacrificing, you need to be careful your salary sacrifice doesn't take you over the cap. You'll need to adjust for the increase in the super guarantee. That's the challenges of, of superannuation, isn't it? It's a very complex environment. So there's things you do need to be aware of, and we are going to cover off on those caps in a couple of slides time. But Sonia, why would someone consider salary sacrificing? We know that everything that comes into superannuation is taxed at 15%, but how can you make salary sacrifice work for you? Uh, there are tax advantages for people earning more than $18,000. Uh, we know the, the contribution rate is 15%. So the savings are small until you get to 45,000 and then they start to really add up. Um, and of course, if you're on a higher income, 120 to 180 uh, uh, or 180 plus, uh, that uh, difference is over 20%. But even 19.5% uh, is starting to really uh, put money in your retirement savings rather than the tax office's coffers. So uh, it's a compelling reason uh, to salary sacrifice and swap income taxed at your marginal tax rate over to the contribution tax rate. Of course, a downside is preservation for those that are young, but uh, even a small amount of salary sacrifice can compound over the years and make a dramatic difference. For those closer to retirement, there's uh, much more um, a reason to, to do the salary sacrifice. Yeah, and those caps come into play obviously as well and potentially, as we'll touch base a little bit later, 
transition to retirement where you can take advantage of that if you aren't in a position to do so now. Yes. Um, I've got an example for you of a, a salary sacrifice example and to give you a bit of an idea as to what this is. This is uh, based on an individual whose salary is $100,000 per year and we've broken that down into four fortnightly because I guess generally speaking, Sonia, we tend to understand what our pay is on a fortnightly basis but not necessarily the longer term implications to us. So if we have a look at this example, what highlights do you think best promote salary sacrifice as a strategy? This uh, slide actually illustrates that um, it doesn't cost as much as you would think, that, that the net pay uh, is not as impacted um, as you would think by salary sacrificing. Even 5% or $192, it's only going to make $127 difference to the net pay because you're getting the instant tax saving. Of course, if, you, if you're salary sacrificing uh, towards the end of the year and you haven't uh, had time to uh, make the most of the strategy, there are other ways to get money into super, such as the concessional contribution as a bit of a catch up. Or if you have uh, income that's sporadic because you're casually employed or you have your own business, making a personal deductible contribution can be a good way to top up your super as well, either in, with conjunc in conjunction with the salary sacrifice or on its own. Yeah, perfect. I like, I like the figures at the bottom. Um, and, and those are definitely, they're big picture figures. But if you have a look at it um, over 10 years, if your salary is sacrificing 5% of your income on 100K, you're going to save $17,000 on income tax um, over that 10 year period. And I think we can all appreciate that the government needs less of our money to misspend um, <laughs> than they currently get. And, uh, and, and that just keeps things interesting. So yeah, rather than pay to pay, it's a good option to, to consider the way forward uh, longer term. Now, can We've got to discuss, I guess, the contribution options that you do have, and these are opening up uh, in recent times for a lot more people, uh, which we'll touch base on as well. But to touch base originally, we're going to talk about concessional contributions. Now, concessional contributions are anything that your employer contributes, whether that be their superannuation guarantee or a voluntary amount that they contribute on top of that, which happens from time to time. Um, anything that you salary sacrificed is considered a concessional contribution. And by concessional, it means that you're paying that concessional taxation rate of 15%. So the salary for sacrifice attracts that. The other one that Sonia mentioned on the previous slide is a personal deductible contribution. And that's where you make a contribution throughout a financial year or towards the end of a financial year. And on part or all of that contribution, you can claim that as a tax deduction as well. There are caps on how much you can get into superannuation though. Currently for the current financial year, the rate ran up this year, it's now 27,500. You probably are aware that it was 25,000 previous to that. Um, but Sonia, I think a lot of people probably aren't aware of the carry forward rule. Oh, I have had so much use out of this rule and uh, excuse me if I get a bit excited about it, but it's um, it's a, a look back rule that enables us to go back to 2019 and see if there was any gap under the cap. Uh, if your balance is under 500,000, you are now well, on the 1st of July of the current financial year, uh, you are able to look back to that year and carry forward the unused cap for up to five years. Uh, there's enormous strategy we can do with this. Uh, it could be that uh, you use it all in one year or you may carry some over to the next year. Uh, you might be selling a, an investment property and, and need to bank up some uh, concessional cap. So that's a possibility to reduce your overall tax. Uh, I've also had people say to me, well, you know, should I? I've got a while until retirement. But um, one example is I've had uh, somebody with an older spouse, they've been able to use the uh, carry forward concessional rule to put a considerable amount into super. And then we've been able to super split up to the older spouse, and they've been able to start a pension with the money. So it's, it's not as preserved as they would have thought. So um, 
lots of things we can do with this rule. Uh, it is very important though to check your balance on the 1st of July uh, because uh, if you've got a, a super accounts that you have forgotten about, you could easily be over the uh, threshold and not be aware of it. Yeah, and I, I suppose getting it wrong can be um, a little bit tricky. There are penalties applied if you go exceeding the concessional contribution limits? Yes, they're, they're not as draconian as they once were, were but they, they still are um, a, a penalty uh, with 9% interest and nobody likes getting a nasty letter from the tax office in, in my experience. No, I'm one of those, definitely. <laughs> Um, but I guess there's a, there's a lot of strategies, I suppose. I think one yes. of the takeaways I'd like people to make from this particular slide and from your explanation of it, Sonia, is that there's a lot of different strategies. And if you aren't in the superannuation game or a financial advisor, um, you may not be aware of the opportunities that do exist. So I encourage you to reach out to whether it be your local regional manager, your RM, if you've got your own um, advisor or you would want to utilize one of ours they are definitely a resource that are at your disposal and they can help you make the most of of your money in that sense this is where i was referring to sonia where things are starting to open up now we haven't been able to update the slides because the legislation has only really just been approved um, but if you've been watching the news, you'll understand that non-concessional contributions are changing. So at the moment, if you are under 67 years of age, you can contribute up to $110,000 per year uh, into your super from a non-concessional source. So non-concessional is another way of saying after tax. Basically, you've, it's already been um, taxed, it's yours, it's in your bank account or, or some other investment, but you can then use that as a non-concessional contribution. So it's $110,000 per year, or you can bring forward two further years and contribute up to $330,000 in the first year. It just means that you can't put anything in in the two subsequent financial years. Where the non-concessional contributions are changing, Sonia, is between 67 and 74. Would you like to tell everybody the good news? I'll let you do the good news. <laughs> The work test is falling away for those people between 67 and 74. Um, that's been a big hurdle. Um, we know that uh, the caps have come down over time. Gosh, you could put in a million dollars when I first started in this industry, but um, because they've squeezed the caps, uh, it's made it harder for people to get money into super. So this is reversing a little bit of that uh, and giving you more opportunity at the, the time you have perhaps some inheritance money or sale of property money or you're downsizing. All these things can mean you can get money into super and have it in a very um, tax effective environment. Uh, not only is the work test falling away, but you'll be able to use the bring forward rule for longer um, up to 75. So uh, good news all round. Uh, that applies from 1st of July, 2022. It's not in force yet. You mentioned in a discussion that I had with you earlier, Sonia, that um, just to be aware, the work test is still going to apply for concessional contributions moving forward. Is correct. That correct? Yes, concessional contributions, um, you know, while, while they're um, not going to suit everybody, some people still could benefit from them, but you'll have to have to do some work and with the work test for those uh, who aren't aware is 40 hours in a 30 consecutive day period and it doesn't include babysitting grandchildren unfortunately uh, you do actually have to have some gainful employment where you've got some income appearing on on your tax return. Well that being said that might be a reasonable retirement strategy to charge the children <laughs> um a, a small oh. fee for your services uh, yeah, and it will still be uh, you'll still be underpaid but <laughs> <laughs> there's truth in that especially if you're my two children <laughs> um there are also some other ways that you can contribute or boost your superannuation um i think you've already mentioned that there's spousal splitting where you can 
move money that's contributed concessionally into your account into your spouse's account yes. you can make a direct spousal contributions on you can't you and that will potentially ha save you some some tax yes yeah, so if your spouse is under 75 you'll be able and, and this is a um, you know the, the age has expanded for the spouse contributions as well if their income is below forty thousand dollars and you put in three thousand as a spouse contribution you can get a rebate of five hundred and forty thousand now you might put in less the rebate will be forty dollars sonia if you saw it lying on the street bill you'd pick it up <laughs> so, uh, i see uh, people just put in maybe the 110 themselves, but they actually could have put in, um, you know, 107,000 as a non-concessional contribution and the spouse can put in the other three and overall optimise this situation. So there's, um, you know, good strategy there. It does count towards the non-concessional cap. So to avoid going over the cap, um, you know, take care with those, but why not get a bit of your tax money back if you can yeah. for your spouse? Um, will we go over the downsizer rules now? I, I like the downsizer in theory, and that is another uh, opportunity that's becoming a little bit more flexible in recent times. Yeah, so uh, we're using this a lot uh, more than I thought, uh, because often people will uh, buy a smaller home, uh, but the, the transaction costs and so on mean that they may not have any change left over. Um, but many times they do. Uh, that could just be sitting in the bank under uh, old rules, but now we're able to use the downsizer rules, provided you've uh, owned the property for 10 years or more, and it is partially or fully exempt from gap capital gains tax, which it will be if you've lived in it. And uh, for the year up to 30th of June, 2022, uh, you need to be over 65 to make a downsizer contribution. The good news is though, from the 1st of July, uh, people over 60 will be able to use this rule. Um, I had a question on that one, Sonia, and I don't, I'm not sure that people um, are aware of it, but you don't actually have to use, necessarily have to use the proceeds of the sale of the house to utilize the downsizer rule. Is that right? Precisely. You might actually you just, have... just have to trigger the rule. Yeah, and so... um, you do have a very strict time frame within which to get the money in. But if you happen to have some shares or cash sitting in the bank, uh, even if it's not change left over from downsizing, you could actually be upsizing. Uh, you can use the rule to get some other assets. Um, into super and simplify your finances or get into the low tax or tax free environment uh, and have access to a diverse range of investments in super. So having people uh, be eligible for this from age 60 um, means that they can also use the non concessional rule at the same time. Um, whilst a downsizer rule is like a non concessional contribution in that it's not taxed. Uh, going into the fund or coming out, uh, it doesn't count towards that other cat we talked about. Yeah, it's all money on top. It's excluded from any of those caps, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, I guess the other way to boost your superannuation, in, in, and it's worth considering, is whether or not you decide that you've got multiple superannuation funds and you decide to consolidate them into the one fund. Um, I guess the benefits of that are generally that you are reducing the administration fees that are associated with multiple superannuation funds, um, but you might also be paying multiple insurance premiums at each of those funds as well. So. Um, before taking any action, it's it's worthwhile considering your insurance needs and and how those can be met most efficiently. But potentially, if uh, if there's no need for an insurance uh, issue on 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 your behalf, uh, there may be benefits in consolidating. Um, so that's the other option as well. Now, to answer the question that we had, sorry, Sonia, were you going to say something? No, no, no. Excuse me. Um, now, the question that we had uh, a little bit earlier was, how old do you need to be to be able to access your super? And uh, this slide is 
indicative of that. So first and foremost, there's this wonderful term that the government refers to as your preservation age. Preservation age essentially means that you've reached the age where you can access your super if you meet certain conditions. Um, so that condition of release is that you've reached a preservation age. So if you were born um, in the lead up to 1963, then the oldest your preservation age is 58 years of age. Anyone born after the 30th of June, 1964 uh, will need to be 59. And sorry, 60, 30th of June, 60, um, will have to be 60 years of age. So for a selfie, for example, born in 75, um, I have to be 60 years of age to have reached my preservation age. You also need to be either generally retired, genuinely retired from the workforce. Um, and, and so you're never intending to return to uh, gainful employment. Now, so on your gainful employment, I guess, isn't necessarily mean that you aren't working at all, does it? No, no, uh, you can work up to 10 hours a week and still say you're genuinely retired at that point in time. It is a point in time test though. Uh, so a common question is what, what if I retire, but later find I, I want or need to go back to work? There's nothing preventing you going back to work. Uh, it's just that subsequent to that, any contributions you make will be once again preserved and you won't need to meet another condition of release to access the new contributions. Perfect. Um the other option is that you've reached your preservation age and you cease an employment arrangement. So um, an example that I tend, <coughs> excuse me, an example that I tend to use in this particular instance is that you might have a full-time job uh, and you have a second, just casual job, which is bringing in a little bit of extra income. If you were to leave that, uh, that smaller casual job, then for all intensive purposes, you've ceased an employment arrangement and you would be able to access money from your superannuation at that point in time. Um, you can continue to work and there's no impact in, in, in that sense whatsoever. Mm. The magical age, I think, Sonia, though, is 65. Um, not that I necessarily want to work through to age 65, but <laughs> if you are at age 65, then you have full unfettered access to your superannuation in pretty much any way you'd like to take it. Mm. I had someone last week uh, tell me they'd received their letter saying uh, their benefits had all moved from preserved to unrestricted, non-preserved. Happy birthday, you know, you, you've now got full access. Uh, you don't have to start a pension uh, with that money, but there could be compelling reasons to do so. Uh, remember, we talked about the, the zero tax on account-based pensions. Well, uh, that... Uh, tax saving could be substantial. Uh, just to, to have the money move from accumulation to pension, uh, you do need to draw at least the minimum pension though. So we can always find smart things to do with that money coming out. But uh, if you meet a condition of release, uh, it's worth having a chat uh, to somebody that can help you look at uh, how, how to make the best use of that situation. If, and if anybody does get stuck finding a, uh, an appropriate use for those funds, I'm <laughs> more than happy to provide my bank details to anyone genuinely interested. Um, so I guess the options in terms of how you do access superannuation once you have uh, access to it, Sonia, um, and a pretty simple slide admittedly, but you obviously have the choice of a lump sum, or there are a few different types of income streams that are available to you all allocated pension accounts. Correct, or they could be used in conjunction. Uh, you might want a lump sum to buy a new car or pay out a mortgage, uh, but you can have the remainder in an income stream, giving you a regular um, deposit just as your pay comes to you. Uh, it's a very flexible product because you've got a choice of payment frequency and uh, again, those tax-free uh, income earnings. Uh, building or making your retirement savings last longer. So we'll go into those particular options then. Um, so obviously, as we start out in our working lives and throughout, um, when we continue to work, our employers must contribute for us. And so we start out with a superannuation account. Um, one question that, that has come up um, just before I, I went to this slide is that, 
can someone open up a new accumulation account if they're retired and drawing an income stream already? And the short answer is yes, you can. Absolutely. Uh, you can also have more than one super account. Uh, we actually sometimes quarantine non-concessional contributions from concessional contributions uh, because their strategy then that can be done to reduce death benefits tax, uh, which uh, is probably a good time to, to quickly talk about that. Um, many people aren't aware of uh, death benefits tax. It's not actually called that in the legislation, but effectively uh, once money passes to non-dependents uh, for tax purposes, there will be uh, tax sent to the tax office by the trustees of the fund uh, out of your super account if you have taxable component. That is money that's come from concessional contributions or earnings. So uh, there are ways to, to uh, reduce the impact of the taxation uh, by separating different types of contributions and or doing strategy to move from one to the other components. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's definitely some strategies. I will preface that response though to say that first and foremost to create a superannuation account, you obviously have to be able to uh, contribute to that superannuation account to make it worthwhile. Uh, or be able to roll money in that's a possibility that you just want to roll over into that account. Correct. Um, so if we have a look at the options, uh, so once we've got superannuation account, and obviously we've discussed the different types of contribution options that are available there, we, we probably didn't mention uh, that the government's co-contribution is another one that can go in there. If you do consolidate, you're obviously transferring money from another superannuation fund into this one. Uh, if you take advantage of the downsizer contribution, and any earnings within your superannuation account is taxed at 15%. Once we move to, or we're transitioning to retirement though, and we're creating a pension account, um, Sonia, there are definite advantages in terms of you know, tax treatment and, and those sorts of things within a pension account. There are, uh, but um, it's, it's not for everybody. Some people don't want to draw money out of super. They prefer it just to, to bubble away and they're happy to pay the 15% tax. You might even do a partial uh, transfer to a pension account. You can always roll money back woods and forwards. Uh, you're not locked into a pension. Uh, a lot of people think that you can't uh, or that you can just take the regular payments as well, but you can take lump sums out of a pension account. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's, much it's much better than what people think it is. You could take that out and go down and put it black on black at the casino if you wanted to. <laughs> not that I would, not that I would. And that's not a financial <laughs> strategy that I'd like to see anybody attacking here. Transition to retirement is a very interesting one, Sonia. And I, as I mentioned earlier, it's probably not as effective as it was when it was first introduced, but there are still potentially advantages to select individuals uh, in creating a transition to retirement. Of course, initially it was introduced so that people that were looking at reducing their working hours uh, over time in the lead up to retirement, but still needed the same level of income could offset uh, that loss of hours with money from the transition to retirement pension. Now, similar to superannuation, your investment earnings within a transition to retirement are now taxed at 15%, um, which is where that is a little less effective than where it was in the, in the first instance. Um, another thing to be aware of is that there are, is a minimum amount that you must take out of a, a pension account each financial year starts at 4%, Sonia. Um, and currently, though, there is the provision that you can actually reduce uh, your minimum drawdown amount by 50%. And that's some more exciting news that's come out of the government in recent times. That's right. It was only announced Friday that the minimum pension uh, rule uh, has, it's going to continue. You can take 50% of the standard minimum next year. Uh, provided it gets through um, the legislation, but we don't see why not. Uh, it, it's you know, one of the silver linings to COVID is that people that don't want or need this money to come out can, can still get the tax-free earnings, but draw less 
they maybe live on their cash while there's periods of volatility. Um, the transition to retirement pension is still a useful product. And where we're using it is, is for people that want to salary sacrifice a bit more. So we did talk about that wonderful carry forward concessional contribution rule. So perhaps if you increase your salary sacrifice, in normally you, you might find that your net pay is not then enough to live on, but what you could do is supplement your income with uh, an income stream or a transition to retirement pension. Uh, I've used it to help people pay off their mortgage faster. Uh, people uh, in their 60s that have never owned a home or uh, haven't owned a home for a while and just want to get a deposit together might go up to the 10% maximum uh, and take out a couple of 10% back to back um, and use it for a home deposit. And, uh, you know, th this wonderful strategy that um, we can use for this pension. Um, so I think it's not dead in the water yet. Um, and I, I guess the other thing with that as well is that it's, a, it's also an option to take people through that carry forward rule that we were discussing earlier as well. Yes, yes, um, exactly right. Um, you could, could take up an, a single pension payment, maybe not even a regular payment. It could be a once-off annual payment that you then drop into super and claim on your tax. There is a mention there if you're under 60 as well. So for those who have a preservation age under 60, you could, um, could start this pension, but you will be taxed. Um, if you've got no other income, though, um, with the 15% tax rate, yeah, that's equivalent to about $45,000 worth of income that you can earn from a pension account before you start paying tax. So uh, it could suit some people to do that. Excellent. Uh, the other pension option um, that is worth considering is, is a standard allocated pension. So you're either fully retired from the workforce, as Sonia mentioned in an earlier slide, uh, where your funds are unrestricted, non-preserved, and you can create an allocated pension from those monies. Now, the benefits of an allocated pension is there's no tax on investment earnings, and assuming that you're over 60 years of age, at least, everything that you withdraw from that pension is tax-free. Same principles applies in terms of there is a minimum that you must withdraw from a pension each financial year. Um, as I said, it starts at 4%, but it increases as we get older. And so far with the extension for the next financial year, you can reduce that minimum drawdown by the 50% um, across all age groups. One of the significant differences, Sonia, between a transition to retirement and an allocated pension is that you can take, there's no maximum, so you can take lump sum withdrawals out from time to time as well as required. You can, yes, without that maximum. Um, you could take the whole lot and put it on the black chip bill, but just remember it's harder to get money back into super because of the cap, so uh, take care with what you draw out, but uh, yes, it's um, your money if it's unrestricted. Uh, just again, I want to assure you that that is not reliable financial <laughs> advice. I have not course, ever recommended that. Of course you would put it on red, Sonia. <laughs> um, now, there's a couple of different uh, pension options at our farm. And Sonia, I'll get you to run through these because I know that you know them intimately and, and the different options that are available. But if we start off with our retire choice allocated pension and some of the features that are involved in that. Uh, as the name suggests, retire choice gives you choice with your investments. Um, so it is an income stream uh, like our other product. However, this time you, you can choose uh, which investment options from this range. Uh, so diversified options on the left, single assets on the right. Single assets can be helpful to build your own portfolio. But if you want a diversified mix, um, then um, we can find a, an option that suits any level of risk appetite. There's the socially responsible option as well. Uh, they're not in any order of risk uh, in the way that they're listed there. Um, shares is diversified. Uh, it's in that list because it's a mixture of international and Australian shares, uh, but all the other options have a mixture of defensive and growth assets. Thank you. Um, 
just keep those questions coming by the way as I as I move through to this this next slide if you have anything whether it be about the products or anything that we've said through out the presentation so far um, please just send those questions through we'll make sure that you get an answer and get the most out of the uh, the event this evening um, but in the meantime our other pension product uh, and award winning product I might include is our retire smart product Sonia Absolutely, Bill. Uh, this product has a difference in that instead of choosing the investments, uh, there's two options in there and it's called, well, they're used for a bucket strategy. Uh, you have approximately two years worth of pension payments sitting in a cash option and the rest is in a growth option that um, does the, um, the heavy lifting and if there are earnings, uh, they can be used to top up the cash bucket when it runs low. If the cash bucket gets too full, you can invest the money back into uh, the growth bucket. Uh, so this is designed to reduce the impact of volatility on your pension drawdowns. And it really does suit some people to have this in place, uh, but it won't suit everybody because of the growth nature of the growth bucket, uh, taking a bit more risk than some people are comfortable with. So uh, we can replicate this strategy in the retired choice product uh, manually. We can um, have your two years worth of pension payments or whatever suits uh, the strategy and, and do that uh, to suit any level of risk tolerance. Uh, we, uh, we do have uh, it on the wish list to make this product available for all levels of risk uh, tolerance uh, because it, it is popular for those who use it. And as you said, Bill, award winning. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps not necessarily going to meet that wish list given um, as everybody's probably aware, we're looking at merging with Unisuper and um, there's a lot of that up in the air at the moment, but um, if this strategy does interest you, it, it's certainly something that I would recommend someone seek advice on to make sure that you fully understand, I guess, the risks associated with uh, the product and that you're comfortable with that. And if you do understand how that all works, that's certainly going to help you make a more informed decision for sure. Um, so I guess that covers off the superannuation and the pension products that are available with the fund and we've talked about the contributions. Um, another part of that jigsaw puzzle that we outlined at the beginning, the Sonia, and that holistic approach to our retirement, um, age pension does form a, a, a piece of those, of those puzzles. Um, so just want to start with outlining how does someone meet the conditions for age pension and, uh, and what sort of money is available through that. Uh, sure, Bill, uh, thanks. You need to reach age pension age. Uh, in the future, it will be 67 for everybody, but at the moment, there's still some uh, younger age groups uh, meeting that requirement. Uh, you then need to have been a resident for 10 years uh, unless you're uh, from a country with an agreement such as New Zealand, uh, but 10 years as a rule, uh, then if you tick those boxes, we look at the asset test and income test uh, simultaneously and whichever one uh, gives the lowest result is the one that Centrelink will use uh, for your age pension payment. Uh, there's a reason they call it means testing because it's mean uh, and there are thresholds uh, that have uh, come up at the lower end, come down at the top end. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, I guess less people are eligible at the top end. But uh, if you if you are eligible, it's a way to get your tax, some of your tax money back and make your own retirement savings last longer. Always a good option. Um, so this is the age uh, that you can access the age pension in, as it currently stands. And Sonia's kind of highlighted that at the moment it's in its process of moving out to age 67, but anybody joined, anybody born between the, before, sorry, the 31st of December, 1956, uh, it's currently 66 years and six months of age. Uh, but then the rest of us are gonna be going through until 67. We won't need this slide in 18 months. That's okay. <laughs> I won't need it after my lotto wins, Sonia. 
Um, so how do they how do they measure how much someone is eligible for under the age pension, Sonia? I know there are a couple of tests, and we're going to start off with the assets test that I've got on the screen for everybody at the moment. And um, just be aware, this is for uh, a single person at the moment. Yes. A single person who's a homeowner um, will have different thresholds to a non-homeowner. You can see the lower threshold uh, in the mauve colour. Uh, if your assets are under that lower threshold, then you will get the full age pension. This is provided you're under the asset test, not the income test. Uh, and then the top threshold is the cutoff point for getting no pension at all. And then if you're in the uh, blue section in the middle, you will get a partial pension. Uh, the the non-homeowner, of course, um, is able to have more assets because it's uh, assumed they'll have rent and more expenses. Um, but the important thing is that um, you know, uh, being aware of these thresholds, because Centrelink's not going to come knocking at your door when you're eligible. And even if you're not eligible at the start, after a period uh, of self-funding in retirement, um, your assets may be used up to the point you're, you're then eligible. So uh, at any point, we can help assess people's eligibility to save them the hassle of filling in paperwork unnecessarily, or to give them comfort that yes, that's a good thing to do. Um, and I'm just going to bring up the couples screen for you, Sonia, to, to go through some of those thresholds. But one of the questions that's actually been asked, and it might be worthwhile covering some of the other um, items that are uh, formed in, within the asset test, but is superannuation considered an asset under the age pension test? As an individual, if your age pension age, then your superannuation will be uh, an assessable asset, uh, whether it's an accumulation phase or pension phase. Uh, there is something to note, though, if you're a member of a couple, and here are the couple's thresholds, if you have a, an age differential and the elder spouse is age pension age, but the younger spouse is not, uh, anything in accumulation phase for the younger spouse won't be an assessable asset. So it's actually hidden from the asset test. Uh, there are strategies then, of course, moving superannuation or assets from uh, the older spouse to the younger spouse's name to effectively uh, increase eligibility for age pension for the older spouse. Uh, but uh, we do take great care with that because with any positive, there's also a risk or a cost. So uh, we're always making sure that the benefits outweigh the costs. But, but the strategies there uh, for those who, who want to get not only the age pension, but you get the uh, concession card with it, which people uh, love. Oh, I trust my better half too, Sonia. <laughs> What's um, yours is hers, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've been told. Um, the other element, okay, is the income test. Now that is uh, the flip side. So how does this get measured and how do the two interact, Sonia? Good question. Uh, whilst most people will fall under the asset test in retirement, um, the income test uh, does come into play for those, those who have government pensions or investment properties. Um, this may be the overriding test that determines their age pension. And the reason for that is that um, if you're not working, uh, then your income may only be deemed income on your financial investments. And the deeming rates have come down. Thanks to COVID, the, the highest deeming rate is only 2.25%. Uh, so, um, most people won't have this income test apply, but uh, you can see the thresholds there. Uh, another important thing to note is if you're doing some work, the first $300 won't count uh, towards the income test, uh, thanks to the work bonus. And there's some good rules around the work bonus. If you uh, don't use it all in one fortnight, you can carry it forward up to $6,000. Uh, so you can bank some up there. Uh, there's also... Uh, again, advantages to having money in accumulation phase for a younger spouse if you're a member of a couple. Uh, we'll just run through uh, some other things that uh, 
people might not be aware are exempt assets and aren't deemed to earn income. One of them is a funeral bond up to the Centrelink threshold of $13,500. And there are annuity style of products uh, that are concessionally treated for Centrelink under both tests. Uh, so they could be used for people sitting on that top threshold uh, to get them under and get that uh, bit of age pension and, con and the concession card. We actually got another really good question in regards to um, the age pension, Sonia. Um, a, a gentleman started an allocated pension in 2010. Is that balance included under the assets tests? So we're very careful to have um, a look at people's pensions um, that where they've been in existence for a while. Um, they could be one of the old grandfathered pensions, but um, you would say uh, in the main, most people's pensions will be counted towards the asset test and will be deemed to earn income. Some of the old grandfathered pensions have a different kind of income and a different sort of testing. So if, for example, an account set up prior to 2015 where you were already receiving the age pension? Correct. Is that the one? Yeah. Yes. So, but potentially, I suppose um, it, it is included. It may be included differently to uh, pensions set up in more recent times. But um, if that was your question, could I just recommend you maybe reach out and um, get some more specific information and potentially some financial advice if that's going that's to right. help you do that as well. There are um, some some people that can take advantage of stopping and restarting an older style of pension as well. They may be eligible for more Centrelink, but that's not necessarily the case. So we do take good care with that. Yeah, we've just got to be a little bit careful, I suppose, not to steer anybody down the wrong path if we no, go too specific. No, it's not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> that circumstance. That's, a, that's how Sonia earns, uh, <laughs> earns the, the fee for any advice. So let's assume that you've gone through both of those tests, obviously, and they've identified one way or the other, which one you're going to be measured on your Sonia. Um, this slide dictates, okay, how much you might be entitled to. And I know there's three uh, little circles on the screen there in front of you. Could you explain to us what they mean and how that kind of works? Probably the last one in particular. Yes, uh, these are the annual payments. Um, if you're single, then an easy way to work out what that is per fortnight is just to, to round it to 26. It's nearly $1,000 per fortnight. Um, then uh, for a couple, 38,000 um, is going, to, I guess, um, yes, it, it's going to give you a substantial lift um, to your income. Uh, but then if you're apart as a member of a couple, you go back to the single rate. Um, some people will ask if this uh, being apart due to ill health is where you're sick of each other. Uh, no, that does not count. You have to, yeah, there are various rules around that separation to get the full age for the single rate of pension. Um, but the, the middle bubble actually shows then uh, what one member of a couple will get. And that's important if the older uh, person in the couple is age pension age, but the younger one isn't. It's exactly half the couple rate. Not too bad. I mean, as you can see over time, once you've reached retirement age and you need to fund yourself for a particular 20 years, this, this can form a significant portion of, um, of that strategy. Precisely. Um, so, okay, let's assume that you've, you've gone through the age pension um, situation, you've applied for that, and whether or not you receive the age pension or not, you may still be eligible for uh, the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, Sonia. Uh, this is for people uh, that don't have the age pension concession card. So it'll be people that, uh, for one reason or another, um, are above the thresholds. But this is a, a test for this card, it's an income test only. And you can see that uh, those income tests are higher than what is applied to the age pension. Uh, as a rough rule of thumb, if you've got under 3 million in financial assets, then you can um, be likely to or be um, 
pretty sure you'll be eligible for this Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, provided you meet the residency rules and you are age pension age already. Uh, so uh, the income test includes deemed income on your financial investments, any employment income, uh, rental property um, returns. Uh, it doesn't include the actual money you're drawing out of your super. Um, so that's important to note as well. It's just the deemed income on your balance. Cheaper medicine is a win for mine. Oh, um, definitely. Uh, bulk billing at the doctor if your doctor offers it. Uh, lower rates and bills. It will depend on the council or the utility provider and who you get on the phone sometimes. Uh, not, not everybody on the with the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card will get the discounts on their utilities, but many are telling me they do. And, and that can make thousands of dollars difference a year. And estate planning. Estate planning. Um, I guess this is something that is also misunderstood. I'm just trying to move through these slides a little bit quicker because I understand we're going a little bit over and I apologize uh, for that. Um, estate planning though is very, very important. It's something that we touch base on many, many times, but a lot of people don't understand, Sonia, that um, superannuation is not automatically transferred to the will. It's actually treated under different legislation. That's right. You can, you can direct your super to be uh, part of your estate, uh, but unless you do that, it's actually uh, going to be uh, sent to your nominated beneficiaries, or if you don't have nominated beneficiaries, then it's a quite complicated process. Um, so uh, I guess uh, having the documentation in place, uh, make sure it meets your wishes is very important to make sure the right assets end up with the right people at the right time and you can minimize tax and um, those sorts of things. Uh, so we do uh, help people look at uh, the issues with leaving money directly or leaving it via the estate. But uh, I think if you, if you want to look at firstly, who can you nominate? Uh, that's something uh, that uh, we can help with and also um, what form of nomination. So Bill, do you get people um, ask questions around those binding nominations? Yeah, definitely. I think when people are, are, are nominating a beneficiary, there are th essentially three different options available to them. Um, and I'll start at the at the lower end of the scale. There's what's called a non-binding beneficiary nomination, which is essentially you providing the superannuation fund with guidance as to where you would like the monies to go to, but it isn't binding on the fund. So the trustees still have to make a decision on where the best place is for that money to go to based on your circumstances at the time of your death. So while you might provide that guidance, there's a chance that your wishes aren't met. Um, at, at the time of your passing. If you do want to ensure that your wishes are met, then you've got two options. Within the superannuation account and pension, you can do a binding nomination, which is just that it's binding on the fund, but there are limited people that you are able to leave it to. So as long as you leave it to somebody that's eligible under the legislation, um, then you can do a binding nomination and the fund must pay as per your wishes. Uh, and the other option, if you've got a pension account, is a reversionary beneficiary, which is also binding on the fund. But again, there's very limited options in terms of who you can um, leave those monies to. But um, those are your options. And if you're doing a binding nomination and you want to leave it to your estate, that's the possibility. And that's make sure that that wish will be met at the time of your passing. Correct. And the good news is that if your uh, beneficiaries aren't changing and you're coming up to the three year expiry date, we now have a, a form that's uh, making the process easy just to refresh that nomination doesn't need witnessing. Uh, just just the account holder can sign that form. Correct. And uh, in interesting times recently, it's been allowed. So if you've your binding nomination does have to be renewed every three years. And for every three years, you no longer have to do the, the full process. We're now doing an abbreviated process where if you're just confirming your existing nomination, then you'll absolutely be able to just sign that document yourself and send that back. And we do obviously uh, let you know when those, those deadlines are coming up. So just be aware of that. 
Um, I'm just going to go over that. I will just briefly say in this instance that um, and Sonia and our other planners are able to help anybody that has uh, a need to do uh, for advice in regards to aged care, whether that be for yourselves or your, uh, your elderly parents. Um, it's a very, very complex environment uh, and it's worthwhile seeking professional help. Someone that does it day in, day out, Sonia? Uh, true. Uh, it's so complex. We do actually do seminars and webinars on this topic alone so stay tuned yeah definitely um so just keep an eye on our website obviously if there is anything from an aged care it will be displayed on there and advertised uh similarly uh we went through a lot of the centrelink stuff a little bit earlier um there is a very specific webinar in regards to centrelink that will be available on our website soon as well so just keep an eye on that now we're wrapping up towards the end of this, but just want to touch base with you as to how you may be able to uh, access some further information once you leave here this evening. Um, starting with general information, you can call our contact centre and uh, their award-winning staff can help you with any of your general superannuation questions, forms or account information, um, as can any of your regional managers like myself. Um, just give them a call and call 1300 658 776 we'll be able to help you out or if you're in in schools or anywhere else out there and you see one of us within your work environment please come up touch base um, and ask any questions that you might have there's also uh, a limited advice option so um, you may not need a full financial plan and you've got very specific needs whether they be contributions your investment options insurances or in particular transition to retirement following on from that today um, then there's our limited advice option. Now, um, I don't like the, time, the term limited advice, Sonia. They, it's basically limited dose products. That's why it's called that. Um, but these are generally a phone conversation. They're at no additional cost to you because they form a part of your membership fee. So they're something that you could take advantage of anytime you want um, as a member of the fund. But the the piece that is resistance is coming and having a chat with somebody like Sonia or one of our other financial advisors that are across the country. Um, and Sonia, you can help with such a broad range of things. It's not just superannuation anymore, is it? No, no. Uh, the fund's very supportive in making sure uh, that we're here to help people understand the impact on their whole financial situation. We're not only able to help members of the fund, but uh, spouses and non-members. Uh, we can look at investments inside and outside super, insurances inside and outside super, redundancies, uh, taking leave payments at the end of your career, um, all the super strategies, of course, aged care, um, Centrelink, um, it's limitless. Um, anything any other advisor can do out there in advice world. And I trust you, too, Sonia, more than anything. Um, I, I like to tell people when I'm, we're doing these presentations that I've worked closely in the office with Sonia and our other advisor in there is Tom. I see how hard they work. I see... Uh, the people come in that they they deal with and I watch them leave uh, happy. So hand on heart, I have absolute faith that you're going to get a good plan um, at a very, very reasonable price compared to uh, some of our market competition. Um, and I guarantee you that Sonia and our other planners are going to be working in your best behavior and your best needs. So <laughs> Sonia will be on her We are well behavior. behaved as well. <laughs> well, yes, mostly. <laughs> Um, some other options for you. There's a few things that I'd love for everybody that's on this call with us today to, to do. Um, if you haven't, then please go on and register to access the member portal. There's lots of things that you can do on there at the moment. Um, those was just a snapshot of a couple of the pages that are available, but you should be aware that you can get the, the information that you need to make a contribution. Obviously your balance details in there, you can view or change your investment option and strategy if and, and whenever you want to do that, that's also available. Um, it details obviously any insurances that you have uh, with the fund and should you need to make any changes to those insurance arrangements, that's also something that you can do uh, online. So please do check that out. If you wanted to do a non-binding beneficiary nomination, you are able to do that online, but uh, anything binding or a versionary then that obviously does require you to 
fill in a form because um, we do need signatures and witnesses in the in the first instance. Um, some of you may be aware if you've already retired and you've got accounts and you have access to money, you can actually make withdrawals up to twenty thousand dollars a day on there as well. If you did want to take um, some money along and put it on red at the casino, like Sonia suggested, very convenient. Very convenient. <laughs> except for the, again, not a financial strategy. Um, you may also not be aware that we actually have an app available too. So if you wanted to keep a closer eye on there and if you, you may have some information available on your phone, then please, by all means, download the app from your app store or if you've got a, an Android from, um, I don't know what they call it, but um, you can choose that one as well. Speak to your local RM uh, following this. If you've asked a question, excuse me, and we haven't answered, I guarantee you we will reach out to you throughout the week um, with your local RM to make sure that you do get an answer to that um, and we can go from there. And of course, if you wanted to, to make a financial advice appointment, that's always available should you need it as well. And just to let people know, there's no charge for that meeting. Uh, it's simply a couple of hours of your time. And if uh, we can't help you, we'll be honest. Or if we think, you know, come back in a year or two would be better, we'll be honest. Um, we have to be sure that advice is more than likely to put you in a better position. So uh, it is a worthwhile process, though, just to identify those areas and tune out the noise. There's just so many rules. There's definitely a lot of rules. There are just a couple of questions that I think are, are simple enough to just answer quickly and they may benefit um, the broader group. Um, the, the first one I'll, I'll pose to you, Sonia, must someone be fully retired um, to change over to an allocated pension or could they retire and then go back to work and be re-employed down the track? Good question. Uh, so you need to meet a condition of release and that has to be supported with a statutory declaration, which is either that you've ceased a gainful employment arrangement when you're over 60, or, or that you, at that point in time, don't intend to ever work 10 hours or more again per week. Uh, so um, once that money is unrestricted and got, you can have an allocated pension, uh, if you return to work though, uh, because you've changed your mind, uh, that's, that's a possibility. But remember that statutory doc, uh, document has to, has to be um, signed uh, and you have to be able to you know, put your hand on your heart and say, yes, that's the truth at that time. As a justice of the peace, as a, it's a very complex process, but um, it, for all intents and purposes, yes, you can. Um, the other question is um, just in regards to the process. So can you, do a financial planning meeting online or does it have to be face-to-face -face or over the phone or what are the options, Sonia? Phone, Zoom or face-to-face. -face. I, I do uh, some pretty um, good drawings if, if you come in face-to-face, -face, but uh, Zoom's very convenient and uh, I can share a screen with people and show you some uh, good things as well. So whatever suits people in these COVID times and with floods and what have you. Definitely. I do travel around the state. I go down to Lismore, up to Cairns, and we have other advisors in other states as well uh, with the same options. Yeah, I love face-to-face -face too. I have to admit, I'm a bit old school in that regards, but I do like <laughs> being able to read people's body language and and those sorts of things. And I think it, it does provide a good uh, opportunity to just, I guess, gauge someone's understanding and interest and, and, uh, and delve a little bit further. But all options are basically on the table. Um, one final question for you, Sonia, and I do apologise. There are some questions that I'm not going to be able to answer this evening. Please, I, I, I promise you, someone will be in touch with you by the end of this week to make sure that you get answers to those questions. They are good questions. Um, we just don't have time because we've gone a little bit over. But one last one I, I think is, is probably a very good question. If you know what age you're interested in retiring, Sonia, um, when when would you recommend someone, I guess, investigate their retirement plan? How long before that retirement? Is there a is there a kind of a magic number or? There's no. Uh, I mean, the sooner the better is probably the answer. It's never too late to make uh, adjustments, but also it's never too early. I, I do see people, you know, young people. Uh, come in, I'm speaking about relative to me, uh, get uh, 
people in their 20s that know that they want to retire at 65 and want to make that happen. But I think there's um, a very critical strategy from 60 onwards, because of course you can get money out of super tax free. So uh, we can really uh, accelerate the strategy then. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, um, the other thing that people aren't necessarily aware of is planning for retirement um, does have the benefits of potential tax savings as well, which are something that can happen immediately for you. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, there's investments outside super. We can do things with that and, and build yeah. a portfolio that later then may end up in super or be maintained outside. Yeah, perfect. I do apologise, everyone. That's all the time we've got uh, this evening. I know there's a couple of other questions that have even popped through just as we've gone through there. Um, thank you for asking those questions. Thank you for staying with us for the duration. It's been a pleasure having you all with us this evening. Um, I hope you got um, some useful information out of that. Please be aware that we will obviously be in touch with you if you've asked a question and we haven't answered it and they are some, there are some good questions on there. Um, we wanna make sure that you get that information. So we will reach out and do that um, and uh, have a look at the information pack that'll come out when we, um, when we send surveys out so that you can um, let us know if there's anything that you'd like to see us improve on through our presentation this evening. So. Um, thank you very much for coming. We hope you have a good night, a safe week. For those of you who are in, in uh, New South Wales or South East Queensland, uh, try and stay dry and, uh, and, and keep safe wherever you are because it's an interesting world right now. And thank you, Sonia, for your time this evening. Thank you too, Bill. It's been good talking to everybody. Stay well. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.